thank you all for logging in today. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Substance Use Disorders from Theory to Practice. My name is Jess Samuel and I'm the project coordinator at IRETA. I'll be moderating this webinar today. At this time, I would like to go over some housekeeping items for today's webinar. We would like to encourage you all to participate in the webinar using the chat box or the questions pane. If you have questions for Dr. Fulton or are experiencing any technical issues, please use either the chat box or the questions pane to communicate your questions. Throughout the presentation, Dr. Fulton will stop and ask for questions. At this time, I will read aloud any questions that have been submitted. Again, you can submit questions via the chat or questions pane. Throughout the webinar, all participants will be on mute. Following the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to the evaluation. This webinar is approved for 1.5 PCB and or NADAC credit. You can also request a general certificate of attendance. Certificates may take up to 48 hours to appear in your profile, so we ask for your patience. I will go over all of this again at the conclusion of the webinar. At this time, we will go through three poll questions. We would like to get a picture of demographics of those in attendance and their knowledge of cognitive behavior therapy. There are no wrong answers. These questions will appear on your screen momentarily. So the question should have now appeared on your screen and it is an interactive poll. Please select the best answer as, as it applies to you. I'll give you a minute to make your selection. It looks like most people have um, answered the poll questions. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. So you'll have about um, 20 more seconds to submit any responses. So you should be able to see the responses for the poll results on your screen now. Um, so for the first question, current professional role, looks like the majority of people that are on today or are uh, counselors, therapists, or social workers um, working in the field of either mental health or addiction. And their, the experience of um, cognitive behavioral therapy looks like the majority of people have a fair amount. So hopefully you'll get to learn a little bit more about that today. Um, so I wanna thank everybody for completing the poll questions and we will be recording the webinar today. I would now like to introduce Dr. Heather Fulton. Heather Fulton is a registered psychologist working at Burnaby Center for Mental Health and Addiction located just outside of Vancouver, BC, Canada. It's a publicly funded treatment center for people with severe substance use and mental health disorders. Dr. Fulton is also an adjunct faculty member in the University of British Columbia Department of Psychology and clinical instructor in Department of Psychiatry. Okay, Dr. Fulton, if you're ready, I'll go over, I'll go ahead and hand things over to you. Great, thank you. Welcome everyone to the webinar today. So, oh, 
Hold on, sorry, just having some technical difficulties. Ah, here we go. So our learning to objective today is we're going to describe the overall theory of CBT in general, CBT for substance use disorders more specifically, and then how this model guides and individualizes treatment for substance use disorders. We're also going to identify how a functional analysis can assist in the conceptualizing and tailoring of interventions within CBT for substance use disorders, since this is such a key technique in this uh, intervention. We're also going to differentiate between different types of coping skills intervention and why you might use some at some times and use others at other times. And then at the end, I'll have a couple resources for further information for CBT for substance use disorders. I tried to keep it to just a couple key ones and not bombard you with resources, but feel free to ask me questions at the end if there's some specific learning needs or resources that you would like, and I'll do my best to accommodate those and make some recommendations for you to really meet your learning needs. So based on the survey question, there's a number of individuals who are fairly familiar with CBT. And I'm just wondering right now if you could type in, is your familiarity with CBT primarily with, say, anxiety and depression? Since many people that I work with, that is their experience with CBT. And they don't have too much experience with CBT for substance use disorder specifically. So feel free to type in if your experience is mainly substance use disorders, CBT, or if it's more anxiety and depression. Okay, so I'm seeing some folks with depression experience. Oh, someone with some substance use disorder, CBT experience, fantastic. Well, I have the webinar, oh, mostly treatment of anxiety depression. Okay, that's fairly typical. That's what most people have, and I have the webinar today. It's primarily designed if you have had, say, no experience with CBT, then this you're in the right place. If you have some experience, that's great, too. And if you have lots of experience, including CBT for substance use disorder, that's great. Feel free to sort of pipe in with your suggestions or even those higher level questions. Those are also great. We can all benefit from that experience. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce just the CBT model or theory in general to you all as I would to a client if I was working with them. So just take a moment now to sit back and relax. Imagine you're walking through the woods and you're all by yourself. And as you're walking through the woods all by yourself, you hear a branch snap behind you. What is the first thought that comes to your head? Type in, what is the first thought that would come to your head if you're all alone in the woods and you hear a branch snap behind you? A bear. Yeah, that's a really common one. What was that? So you might have the first question, what's that? Something is there. Maybe it's not clear what. Is it an animal? Yeah, so very, very common thoughts. Uh, first a question, and yeah, is it a bear? Is it something scary? So let's imagine you're in the woods, you're by yourself, you hear a branch snap behind you, and let's go with the thought, it's, oh, there's another thought, someone's following me. Let's go with the initial thought with, that someone had. So there's some variety here. But let's go with the initial thought of it's a bear behind me. What might you be feeling? Type that in. Terror. Scare. Yeah, absolutely. You think there's a bear behind you. <laughs> okay, so some people are having some more thoughts. I'm going to die. Some physical sensations, pounding heart, feeling scared, panic, absolutely. Yeah, another thought, uh-oh, 
Okay, so imagine you have this thought. It's a bear behind me. I'm feeling scared. I'm feeling terror. What might you do? Type that in. Run. Maybe freeze. Again, so some different behaviors. Play dead or run. Run or be paralyzed with fear. Absolutely, right? You're all alone in the woods. A branch snaps behind you. You think it's a bear. You feel terror, feel scared. And then maybe freeze, run, try and go behind a tree and stay still there. Absolutely. That makes complete sense based on what you're thinking and feeling. Now, let's imagine it's the same scenario. You're in the woods. You're all by yourself and you hear a branch snap behind you. But this time, let's imagine you have the thought, it's a baby deer. What might you be feeling in this situation? Type that into the box. Are you feeling surprised? Yeah. Feeling happy, overwhelmed by cuteness, so maybe some excitement there. Absolutely. Oh, okay. So some people are already talking a little bit about uh, behavior. I'll get some Instagram likes. So the behavior, if I think it's a baby deer behind me. I'm thinking, oh, so cute, excited. I'm going to pull out my camera and I'm going to start taking some pictures. Now, any other behaviors that people might be doing? If you're thinking, I'm excited, uh, it's a baby deer behind me, I'm feeling excited, uh, feeling happy, what might else you do? Be still and stare. Okay, I really want to watch. Carefully turn around and see that baby deer. Maybe move closer. Yeah. I wonder where mama deer is. So some other thoughts. So I want to stay quiet. Yeah, turn and look, stop walking. That makes sense. You think there's a cute baby deer behind you. You're excited. You're curious. So we're slowing down. We're turning around. We're maybe taking out our cameras and phones to look at that. Great. So let's look at this. So I had planned these slides in advance. So I had also thought many people think, hey, initially, the branch snaps behind me. I'm all alone in the woods. It's a bear. And we had the, situ the feeling of fear and behavior run away. It makes complete sense. But we also had that same situation. We're in the woods. We're all by ourselves. But when we had a thought instead, it's a baby deer, the emotions were quite different. Curiosity, excitement, um, feeling very happy. And the behavior was also very different. So slowly turning around, taking camera, being quiet, being still. So see how this is the same situation. You're all alone in the woods and a branch snaps behind you. But how you think about that situation really changes what we're feeling, our emotions, and our behavior, what we do. So this really gets to the connection of thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. And this is the CBT model. Our thoughts or cognitions are related to our emotions and our behaviors, what we do. And this is bi-directional. They all influence each other. And with cognitive behavior therapy, we're intervening at the point of cognition and at the point of behavior to change how we feel. Most people, I'm assuming, if you have some experience with CBT, you might be familiar with this CBT triangle. Some folks might also be aware of sometimes you see this hot cross bun model. So if you've ever done workshops or read Christine Podesky's work, The Mind Over Mood, or so in any of her workshops or other manuals, you might have seen the talk rock fun model, which can sometimes be confusing because you're thinking, wait a second, what is it? This is actually the same model. But you see emotions there or feelings? Sometimes they get separated out to our physical feelings and physical sensations and emotions because those physical sensations can also influence how we feel. If you think of someone having a panic attack, the racing heart, shortness of breath, can lead to that thought, I'm having a heart attack, something's really wrong, that can lead to more anxiety. More anxiety provo provokes more anxiety sensation, 
And so they can all influence each other. So I just want to be clear here. If you see this hot cross bun model, it's the same model as that triangle. But we have physical sensations that have been dropped out and are a little bit separate here because they can be really important as well. So that's the CBT model. That's the theory. What do we actually do? What does CBT look like? Well, it can actually vary quite a bit depending on the presenting problem as well as the client because everybody's their own individual and so they've got different strengths and they've got different challenges and stressors that they're facing. However, there are some common key elements throughout all CBT. So first of all, it's a very collaborative relationship with the therapist. I think many people liken it to, say, a coach. You're not a drill sergeant, it's not all advice giving, but it's a coach in terms of supportive, hey, here are some different options, have you considered this, have you tried this? Interventions are always guided by an individualized conceptualization. And so what I mean by that is, why did this person develop this problem, and why do they still have this problem? And so really looking at an individualized person, what are the different factors that are going on there? Because even as we saw with this example of going through a forest, people had different thoughts initially. People had different emotion reactions and people had different behaviors. So everybody's different. So you want to be really individualized there. And CBT, we're typically very present focused. What are the challenges and stressors that someone is still facing and ongoing? CBT, there's a major emphasis on what are the client's goals? What do they want to achieve? Sessions in the therapy is time limited. So typically CBT is say 12 to 16 sessions. And sessions, they're goal focused. They're focused on the client's goals. Sessions, sessions are also fairly structured. So there's a collaborative agenda that's set at the very beginning. So you're always checking in, say how's mood, how things been going what happened in between sessions, but then a collaborative agenda. So the therapist will have things they want to put on the agenda. I want to follow up with this activity. I want to check in on this. But the client is also asked, what's important to you? What do you want to put on the agenda? What's important to talk about today? And there's always a checkout at the end as well. CBT often involves psychoeducation. So talking to someone about that CBT model how emotions and uh, thoughts and behaviors, how they work, different patterns and cycles. And also there's a lot of emphasis on out of session practice and review. So those of you who have some CBT experience, you might be familiar with historically, where there was a lot of emphasis in the, on this and it was, the term was homework. For those of you where perhaps CBT is new, even just seeing that term homework might already be provoking some strong feelings in you. That term homework, it's loaded, right? And it has a lot of negative associations and negative connotations for many people. So now even the Beck Institute, who are the original developers of CBT, Aaron Beck, uh, they are even recommending, okay, instead of using the term homework, use the term action plan. So, that is a great term and it works really well. It's a little bit corporate-y, but can work very well for many people. I personally really like the term practice. We practice sports, we practice music. I really like that term. It works really uh, well for me and the people that I work with. Why CBT emphasizes practice out of session because it's very important for skill acquisition and keeping things real and applicable to someone's life. If you imagine you were trying to learn piano, and that was an important skill for you, and the only time you ever touched a piano was that one hour a week during your piano lesson, how quickly would you learn to play piano? it would probably take a while, right? If you're only touching it one hour a week. So much like any skill that we're trying to acquire, it needs practice, it needs to be done outside of the session. Otherwise, folks are not really gonna see it change very quickly and uh, not gonna really increase that self-efficacy. So out of session practice and review is really, really important in CBT. So, now that we know a little bit about CBT theory, 
a general structure, why do CBT? Is it even effective? Because we really want to be using active treatments with the people that we work with. CBT is one of the most studied psychosocial interventions. There's many uh, studies out there. It's too numerous to go over today, but it is considered a first line or best practice for many different disorders. I have some links or some references to some meta-analyses there if you want to check those out further. And also feel free at the end or at one of our question points, ask questions if you've got some concerns or you're wondering a little bit about this. So now CBT for substance use disorder. So any of you who've looked into this yourself when you say, okay, I want to do CBT for substance use disorder, where's the manual or where are the books? It can get a little bit confusing. If you've done a search, there's not really one protocol or this is one gold standard of this is CBT for substance use disorder. When you look at these different reviews and meta-analyses, often there's different, very related, but different interventions lumped together. So contingency management can be lumped in as that CBT for substance use disorder or motivational interviewing, that CBT for substance use disorder, but then other manuals and other programs with, say, by Alan Marlott, uh, Peter Monty, Kathleen Carroll, those can also be lumped in. And so for the purposes of the webinar today, when I am talking about CBT for substance use disorder, I'm referring to relapse prevention and coping skills training. They're, very, they're two very similar CBT protocols. The names associated with relapse prevention is typically Alan Marlett. You'll see some other books and uh, protocols out there for relapse prevention, and one of the big names that you will see out there is Gorski. And it's not that Gorski's relapse prevention books are not helpful. However, they're not the ones that have been systematically evaluated like Alan Marlett's relapse prevention work has been. And so, I'm looking at that, and that's what I'm talking about today in this webinar. With coping skills training, the names that you will typically see associated on those different manuals and interventions are, say, Peter Monty, Cadden, Kathleen Carroll. Those are those names. I won't be talking about those other ones uh, that I have listed in the slide here that sometimes get lumped in with CBT under that sort of umbrella for substance use disorder, but feel free, ask further questions about that if you want at any point in time during the webinar. So CBT for substance use, again, is it effective? Does it work? And yes, there is quite a bit of research that it has been effective both as a standalone therapy as well as in combination with different pharmacotherapies for different substance use disorders. And again, the research is numerous. I'm not gonna go in it in extreme depth, but I do have references there. So in case you need those, that you want to share, you want to investigate further, I will have those at the end of the presentation as well, the full reference. So let's pause for just a moment. What are people's questions so far? What can I help explain so far? Are people perhaps good and I should kind of keep going? Uh, CBT for nicotine. Ah, there's a huge number of adolescents who are using right now. Yeah, there has been some research in terms of CBT for smoking cessation. If you're talking about, say, CBT for vaping, because vaping, that's a different form uh, of potentially of nicotine administration, although not all vapes include uh, nicotine. Yeah, so vape, you clarified, yes, that vaping was what you were asking about. Vaping is a fairly new method of administration, so I am not aware of anyone who has been using a CBT protocol for vaping specifically. However, my hypothesis would be that perhaps some of the motives and reasons why people use vaping might be very similar to smoking, so I wonder if it would be applicable, but I'm not aware of any studies to date or protocols that address vaping specifically. However, I'm thinking uh, perhaps some of the techniques and strategies that we'll be going over in this webinar today might be applicable where you might find um, so some benefit. I'm hoping that it might apply for that very specific situation. 
Well, let's continue. We'll have some more breaks for questions, especially at the end, where we can go into some of those more fine-grained details as well. All right. So throughout the presentation today, I'm going to use a case example to kind of help demonstrate well, what does CBT for substance use disorder actually look like. Of course, the details, names, uh, identifying things, different factors have been changed to really protect this person's confidentiality. Hopefully, in reading over this case, you see some similarities to the folks that you work with. So Carl is someone that I saw who was in their 30s, and when I saw them, they were reporting alcohol use, cocaine use intranasally, a past history of hallucinogen and cannabis use. And when I interviewed them uh, at intake, they met DSM-5 criteria for mild alcohol use disorder, as well as severe cocaine use disorder. Their last reported use of cocaine and alcohol was 30 days ago. And they also met diagnostic criteria for a major depression disorder, as well as generalized anxiety disorder. When I asked Carl what were his goals for treatment, since remember, goals are very important in cognitive behavior therapy, he reported it was to get his use under control. So I asked him, well, what exactly does that mean for him? And he stated, probably not use any cocaine, although it was very clear that he would really like to still drink alcohol socially. So those are his goals. So let's get into, before what I did with Carl, let's get into the theory of CBT for substance use disorder. So there's some basics here that are really important. So in CBT for substance use, it's addiction is a learned behavior. And there's some very important learning processes that go along here, especially classical conditioning and operant conditioning. So some of this might be ringing some bells for some of you guys in terms of your past schooling. So as a refresher, classical conditioning, that's with Pavlov and the dog. And remember, ringing the bell became associated with the food, and so the dog started salivating. There was this learned association of the bell rings and food is coming. Operant conditioning, if you recall, perhaps from some of your schooling or previous experience, is with BS Skinner, and you press a, the rat presses a lever, and, it, and then it gets a sugar pellet. That's operant conditioning, learning through consequences. It's really important to note here that there's important learning processes going on with the development of a substance use disorder and maintenance, but it's not that the biological, pharmacological, or social contexts are not important and don't also play roles here. They absolutely do but it's also that learning is also very important in the development and maintenance of a substance use disorder. So if we're talking about dogs and mice with levers, what does that look like for substance use? It's how it applies is not always clear. So let's look at this in more detail. How would it apply? So let's imagine you feel anxious. Then you take substances and you feel more calm. Learning by association is taking place here. When I feel anxious, I take substances. They're associated in time. There's a learned association there. There's also some learning by consequence. I feel anxious, I take substances, then I feel more calm. There's some learning by consequence there as well. So over time, this can become someone feels anxious and they feel like they want to use substances. And they also may not be sure how else to calm down apart from using substances. These are, this is a demonstration of how that important learning is happening with substance use. So we've got that addiction is a learned behavior. We also, one of the assumptions here is that addiction emerges and may maintain an environmental context. So availability of substances matters. If you could imagine if I was a person who was, say, growing up in Somalia, it's likely that I would have the experience of perhaps trying CAT, which is a drug there, which many people use and is available there. And thus, if I'm trying CAT and it's available there, it's possible I might go on to develop a substance use disorder to CAT. However, if I'm growing up 
in, say, rural Montana, the likelihood that CAT is even available for me to try is, is probably low. And thus, the likelihood I would develop a substance use disorder to CAT is also low to non-existent since I never even tried that substance. So the availability of substances matters to, of course, what people go on uh, to use and may develop problems with. Learning from peers and parents and general societal um, learning is also relevant. So many people in our Western North American context probably have the learning of, I've had a really tough day at work, I need a drink. That's a learning that happens there. That is what someone does after having a tough day at work. That's some important learning that someone that takes place and is relevant for someone who might be experiencing problems. Social deprivation is also important. So the lack of other available rewards. Does someone have another way to receive achievement or to feel good about themselves, to manage stress, manage anxiety? Are there opportunities for that, of learning different ways to manage emotions? This is relevant for maintenance as well as development. And there's also cultural influences. So for example, there's different religions that have different prescriptions and beliefs about substances, for example, alcohol. And so those are relevant for the person that you're seeing because those beliefs, they're important for how someone might have developed a substance use disorder, how they may think about themselves and other maintaining factors. Another key part is that addiction is developed and maintained by thought patterns and processes. So outcome expectancy, that is, what do you think will happen if you use a substance? So if I drink alcohol, I will feel more calm. Or if I drink alcohol, I'll be more social and I'll be a more fun person. Those are important and relevant outcome expectancy. Permission to use, those are beliefs like, I've had a really tough day, I deserve a break. Or this is a great celebration, you know, we should have alcohol to drink here. That's, those are some important uh, beliefs and permission giving beliefs. Self-efficacy is important. So the belief in one's ability to, to achieve a goal, whether that's reduce anxiety through other ways apart from substances or uh, just other things that they want to achieve in their life. It's, can I achieve this, achieve this goal that I want? As well as effective state really matters. So mood, depression, other psychiatric illnesses, those are also relevant. So next what I would like to do, since that talks a little bit about the development of substance use disorder, the next part is I want to go into the model of why does someone continue to use despite wanting to stop, despite experiencing many negative consequences. And what I'm going to do to demonstrate this is I'm going to use the relapse prevention model from Marlott and Gordon. You might be looking at your slides right now saying, 1985, this is a really outdated presentation. And you would be right. It is from 1985. There is an updated model, and I'm going to show you that. But I really like this older model since so it's a little bit more simple, and it's a bit more clear the path that you're going to take. So we're going to go with this more simple model. Bear with me, I'm going to show you the more complex updated one in just a little bit. But again, why does someone continue to use despite negative consequences or despite wanting to stop? In this model, it's someone encounters a high risk situation. For example, they're in an environment like a bar where they used to use, or they're experiencing anxiety. Then they have an ineffective coping response, like, I can just white knuckle it through my anxiety. I'll be fine. Or, you know, I'll just have soda at this bar. I won't use. What happens is often then there's decreased self-efficacy. So my anxiety is not going away. I'm not able to just white knuckle it through. Or I'm not able to, lots of people are offering me drinks. I'm not able to say no. This is really challenging. Or I want to be social. I want to connect to people. I can't unless I'm drinking. This is also paired with positive outcome expectancy. Like, you know what would really take the edge off? Is having a drink right now. This typically leads to a lapse or a use of the substance. And then 
there's something called an absence violation effect. I want to ask folks, have you heard of this term, abstinence violation effect before? Is this brand new to folks or are many people familiar with it? Type it in your box right now. Brand new term? Nope, new, not familiar. Brand new and you work in addiction. Okay, this is a really helpful term. Uh, I love it, it's a very important concept. Yet, when you talk to people and you first say the absence violation effect, many people's eyes kind of glaze over. It's a very technical term. However, if you go by the lay term for it, many people will recognize it. It's the effort factor. Many of us have had this experience. So think of something you have maybe been trying to change in your life. I'll use the example of say, perhaps trying to cut down on junk food in terms of chocolate or chips, that kind of thing, because many people have had that experience in their life. Can you imagine when you've been trying to say, cut back on potato chips and you maybe you've been uh, doing really well for a while, but then you have one potato chip. Have you ever had that experience of F it, I'm that square one, I might as well have more, right? That's the absence violation effect. The absence has been violated, F it, I'm at square one, I might as well just go for it kind of thing. That's the absence violation effect. So when someone has that, that often can then be paired with the perceived effects of the substance. So if it's, say, alcohol, feeling more disinhibited, right? Feeling perhaps the initial anxiety reduction that can happen with alcohol use. And that paired often leads to ongoing use of a substance. I will put a side note here as I'm well aware of lapse, relapse, flip, that those are somewhat controversial terms. Um, I'm using those terms in this because that is what is in this model and in these manuals. Often I just use use with folks that I work with. But we can just talk more in terms of language and terminology, but at least in this webinar and with these models, I'm using lapse and relapse because it's consistent with these uh, models and with the research and the manual. Okay, so what do we want to do? What we want to do is we want a person where they encounter a high risk situation, say feeling anxiety, you know, thinking maybe I could go or finding themselves in a bar where they used to use, I mean, instead, want them to have an effective coping response. So challenging a thought or doing a behavior that's actually going to reduce their anxiety that doesn't involve substances. Then by doing that, they would have increased self-efficacy. Say, for example, hey, I can reduce my anxiety without using substances. And that then leads to decrease likelihood of use. That's our goal. That's where we're wanting to go. So now that we have this older model, let's see the newer one. So this is the more updated model. As you might notice, it's a bit more complicated. It's a bit less clear, hey, wait a second, where am I going? Where am I trying to steer here? You also might notice, though, if you were looking at this previous model, there's some limitations, right? Because you might be saying, hey, wait a second, Heather. Isn't the lack of coping skills, the lack of an ability to manage your anxiety in ways that don't involve substance use, isn't that kind of a high-risk situation? Or isn't perhaps, um, if there's a recurrence of depression, isn't that a high-risk situation? You know, where, where does that fit in? Or different beliefs about substance use, as in, you know, the only way I can meet people is if I drink, that's kind of a high-risk situation, right? Where does that fit in here? And there's some important limitations. Where does motivation fit in here? And so this newer model really incorporates that. So you can see effective stages in there. Coping behavior, so self-regulation, that's in there as well, as well as cognitive processes like motivation, like craving. So again, these all feed back into, well, what is a high-risk situation for people and what are they going to do? And there's still some other key components that were in that previous model, like that absence violation effect. But I like referring to that older model because I find it's a little bit more helpful in using it in terms of a theoretical roadmap of where I want to go 
with people. So I still use that older model, but recognize that it is limited. And there's some other important factors here that are reflected in this newer model that you're also going to want to be taking into account. So now we understand, hopefully, the model of, hey, why does substance use continue to happen despite perhaps wanting to stop or despite negative consequences in someone's life? What are we actually going to do in treatment? Our primary tasks are we want to identify what are the antecedents and determinants of substance use. So what are the triggers? What needs are substances being used to meet? What's the role that they're fulfilling in a person's life? Because people use for important reasons. So reducing anxiety, reducing stress, those are important reasons. However, substances, especially when it's become a substance use disorder, it comes at great cost. And people have important needs that need to be met. It's not a want or a preference. It's a need, a need to have fun. Everyone has that need in their life. It needs to be met. So we want to find other ways of meeting those needs that are not costly like substance use, that don't cause those negative consequences that are in someone's life. That's what we're trying to do with CBT for substance use disorder. So how do we do that? How do we figure out what is the role? How, what are the triggers? What are the needs that substances are being used to meet in a person's life. The technique we use is functional analysis. It really helps you build an individualized conceptualization because people use for different reasons. So we want to be individualized here. Functional analysis is another term. It's a great term, but when you share it with people, again, you kind of get that eye glazed over response. So the phrase that I like to use is a slow motion replay. Everyone kind of knows what that looks like, and that's what we're trying to do with substance use. Often people might say, you know, what happened, if you're asking what happened, you know, at that recent use occasion of, I don't know, nothing happened, I just used. So we want to really break it down slowly and investigate what happened here, because there's some important stuff that happened that we don't want to miss it. And a functional analysis helps us get to what is that important stuff? What are the antecedents and determinants of use? So let's use Carl as our example here. So this is a functional analysis I did with him and what was the most recent use occasion in terms of cocaine. And so we put down the date and the time and I want all the who, what, when, where here. So kind of if I was going to be making a movie remake of this situation where the person used I want to know what are my director's notes? Where can we set the scene before they had the first thought of using? Who are they with? What's the time of day? What's the situation? What are they doing? I want to know all that when I ask them, okay, what's the situation? Then I want to ask, what were you thinking and feeling in this situation? So with Carl, he reported he was feeling really tired. He was hungry. He had skipped supper because he was working late. He had the thought, I could have supper at perhaps the pub downstairs from his work office. He also had the thought, maybe I could meet up with Dan. And Dan was a friend um, that his partner didn't like. And so he also had the thought, my partner hates Dan because he also uses cocaine. And once he had that thought, Carl started feeling guilty and started feeling like, I'm really feeling controlled by my partner. I actually I had the thought, I need, or Carl had the thought, I need a break. I can't take this. I'm actually just going to mess up anyway in terms of my recovery. I might as well use. So then asking about behavior, what happened? So for Carl, he went to the liquor store and he got a Mickey of alcohol. He then went home and he drank that Mickey of alcohol home alone. He call, called his deal, dealer and he used cocaine, but he wasn't exactly sure of the amount. So this hopefully is clear what happened in that situation. The next part of the functional analysis is it's really important to talk to people about what were the upsides of use and the downsides of use. Because this gets to what is the function that it's serving. 
So for Carl, he found that what were the good things that happened as a result of his use? He found that it numbed his emotions, he didn't feel guilty, and he got a break. And I asked him, well, how, how long did any of this last? And he found it lasted about two to three hours while he was intoxicated. If you do a functional analysis with some people, you might find, especially for folks who are really committed to their recovery, really motivated, you might initially get well, nothing good happened, nothing, nothing good happened. It's really important to kind of dig down there and, and ask them, well, even if it was just a little bit, even if it was 30 seconds, is there anything good that happened? Because again, you want to get is what needs might be met here. What, what are the benefits? And there are some important upsides to you in their life, even though there might be many negative consequences, many downsides. But just what, what are the upsides? Even if it was I was high for 30 seconds, that's important. And you still want to capture that in a functional analysis. The next piece is asking what are the downsides? What were some not so great things that happened as a result of use? So for Carl, he reported that he was feeling hungover. He felt really depressed the next day. He was thinking that he wasted his whole Saturday recovery from his use. His partner found out that he used, so there was a huge fight there. He spent a lot of money, and he'd been really struggling with financial problems, so that really added to that problem. And he felt more guilty and was feeling more ashamed. And I asked him, well, how long was, was that lasting? And it was lasting several days, so even though had been quite a while since that use occasion, he was still feeling the guilt, still, still feeling the shame. So let's look at this. We know that we want to get the antecedents and determinants of use, the triggers and what needs the substance use is fulfilling in a person's life. If you look at this functional analysis, what do you think are perhaps some antecedents or triggers uh, or determinants they need that substance use is fulfilling here. Feel free to type some in the box. Any triggers that you notice? Any needs that you think substance use is fulfilling? Boredom, control, hungry, lack of social connection, partner out of town, working late, skipping a meal. Yeah, those are important antecedents, important triggers. Feeling tired, issues, relationships, stress, lonely. Yeah, yeah, so lonely in terms of maybe substance use might be fulfilling. That need, although he did use a loan on this, on this occasion, right? But I think you are picking up on that's an important trigger. Uh, loneliness is an important trigger for him, although I just recognize that in this situation, he was alone the whole time. He didn't actually ever meet up with that friend, Dan. But absolutely, that would be super relevant as well. Stress, yeah. So already, you guys, you're working on an individualized conceptualization for this person that's going to guide treatment. So, Remember, our primary tasks are identifying the antecedents and determinants of substance use, what specific needs are being used to meet, and then, based on that, we're going to develop skills that provide alternative ways of meeting those needs. So, how do we do this? I really like Kathleen Carroll's manual of where her overall strategy for sort of developing the other skills is recognize, avoid, and cope. It's very uh, memorable and people remember it. So what are we trying to do here? What does recognize, avoid, and cope mean? We're trying to recognize what are the antecedents and determinants of use. So you're working with the person, what are their triggers? What are their needs that substance use is being able, is being used to meet? So helping them identify what are those high risk situations that they encounter? Recognize those. You've got to be aware in order to make any changes. Avoid. Avoid triggers or avoid high-risk situations when possible. If you have any experience with CBT, you might be saying, hey, wait a second, Heather. 
CBT, we're typically not advocating avoidance. Usually it's about facing fears or, or coping with that. We're not, we're not uh, advocating avoidance. Substance use is different because there is that strong drive to use uh, as well as the aversive part. It's different from anxiety and it's different from mood. How I really think about this in terms of when to use avoidance is can you avoid a situation or trigger and have a happy, healthy, and fulfilling life? If you can avoid, say, a bar that you used to use in and have a happy, healthy, and fulfilling life, then avoid it. It's so much easier than developing those different coping skills and wrestling with uh, motivation and willpower and all those different things. If you can have a happy, healthy, fulfilling life and avoid that situation or trigger, then do so. Because for everything else, we've got to learn to cope. We might want to say avoid anxiety in our lives. It's not possible. We need to learn to cope with that, for example. So that's where the cope of recognize, avoid, and cope comes in. So what are other ways to meet those needs that substance is fulfilling? We also want to then have practice increasing our self-efficacy for using those coping skills. Because self-efficacy is never going to increase unless you have that behavioral experience of, hey, I can actually manage my anxiety in other ways that don't involve substance use. Until you have that experience, your self-efficacy doesn't increase. That's why practice is so, so fundamental here. There will also be challenging myths and beliefs. Uh, for example, are you perhaps really much more social uh, when you use, right? And when, and is that actually helping your relationships? And truly investigating that with a curious mind, right? This is not judgmental, a rhetorical question. Are you actually more social? It's more, let's look at that. Let's investigate it. Is substance use or alcohol use, is that the only way you can meet new people? Is that totally true 100% of the time? So challenge use those myths and beliefs. We're also going to be working with someone to educate them about the abstinence violation factor or the ethic factor, right? So that they're aware of it. Uh, because often people might have a use, and we want to prevent that use from becoming much greater. And it's not minimizing use. So it's not saying it's no big deal if you have a drink, or it's no big deal if you use a little bit. It is a big deal. It's a crisis situation. And yet, we don't want someone to become so hopeless and overwhelmed and riddled with guilt of, well, F it, recovery is hopeless anyway, and then they have much more use and a much more dangerous situation. We also want to provide some psychoeducation about the effects of substances. For example, the disinhibition effect of alcohol and stimulants, so that perhaps you might have one drink, um, and maybe alcohol is not the particularly problematic substance, but you're disinhibited. So making choices and saying no to offers of other substances might be that much more difficult. And so understanding those associations, understanding the pharmacology of how different substances work. That's what we're trying to get at here. So to review, we're using tracking of and functional analyses, tracking the use, to really understand thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, because that's that CBT triangle, before, during, or after a usification. You can also use this for craving. And you could also use it for, say, close calls or really helpful uh, coping occasions of where they coped really well. Let's play that through. Let's really highlight what are the coping techniques that you did, how did you handle that situation. It's also always really important to get those, po those positive and negative consequences of use or no use, because it really tells you a lot about, say, needs and um, what's driving different behaviors. You also notice uh, in this, with especially a functional analysis, it's a lot of focus on present, current symptoms. Why are they continuing to use right now? What are their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors? It's not that perhaps why did they start to drink alcohol or why they started to use opioids. It's not that that's not important, but we're really focusing on right now, why are they continuing to use? What are their challenges now in terms of use and trying to avoid or reduce use? 
And then also there's a lot of emphasis on perhaps psychoeducation and then practice to really build up those skills, to address those skill deficits of increasing abilities to manage anxiety, manage mood, manage, say, hallucinations or psychotic symptoms and other ways that don't involve substance use. So I'm gonna go through now, what are the different coping skills? And this categorization, this is based on McHugh and how they categorize things, but not all manuals or protocols categorize the coping skills in this way. Sometimes it's just a list, here are the coping skills, and that's fine. I just, I like the categorization, I think it's helpful, but not everyone does that. And what's important here in coping skills is again, this is tailored on why does an individual use and their unique profile, those and the unique antecedents and determinants of use. Because different tools work for different times, much like you don't use a screwdriver for everything, and you don't use a hammer for everything, just the same with different coping skills. It's really individualized and it, it depends. So what are some emotion regulation coping skills? Well, the first is distraction. And distraction can be a very helpful skill for getting through cravings. Because often cravings can be incredibly overwhelming and it feels like they're gonna go on forever or just get worse. So distraction can be really helpful to take someone's mind off and keep them very occupied to ride out that craving peak. There's been some great research on exercise, specifically for stimulant cravings. That's really exciting and uh, promising. And it's not that exercise may not be helpful for, say, alcohol or opioid use cravings. It just hasn't been systematically evaluated, to my knowledge. It doesn't have to be exercise for distraction. It could be anything, as long as it's typically engaging to that person, usually engaging their mind and engaging their body a little bit, tends to be most effective. You want it to be a very engrossing activity because the craving is so powerful, because that urge is so powerful, it has to be something else that's powerful to compete with it. Another coping skill uh, to manage uh, emotions or manage urges and cravings is talking to someone. That could be talking about the urge to use or about the craving, or it could be about something else entirely. It depends what is gonna be most helpful to that person. When you're using or discussing this coping skill with people, Again, folks may already have some experience with this. It's really important to talk about what are the barriers to using a coping skill. Because most people have had the experience, they know they should call their sponsor or should call a family member or friend, but they don't in the moment. So really looking at what prevents you, what are the barriers to make this an effective coping skill that someone's actually going to use. Can there be any practice or coping in advance that would help this? Another coping skill is using mindfulness. This topic could have its own webinar, and there's a great manual by Katie Witkowitz and Alan Marlette on mindfulness-based relapse prevention. Urge surfing is a specific technique in there that's really great, and even with that manual, uh, it comes with access. We can hear audio. Uh, walkthroughs of doing an urge surfing kind of meditation and very helpful. I'm going to have to be a little bit brief just in terms of time, but if you want to know more, feel free to ask questions about that. Other important emotion regulation coping skills is examining and challenging self-talk and beliefs. So when you go through a functional analysis, what are those thoughts like, I could have just one? or I can't take this anymore, it's just gonna get worse, or recovery is hopeless. Really examining those, examining the evidence, is that 100% true 100% of the time? What's the evidence, what's helpful? Looking at those outcome expectancies, like, hey, does alcohol actually help me relax? I might have reduced anxiety, but look what happens to my anxiety afterwards? And really getting that individualized evidence. Looking at permission giving, like, you know, I've had a terrible day, I deserve a break, right? And looking at that, is that helpful, challenging it, what's helpful to this person, is it totally true 100% of the time? Keeping a slip, last, or use in perspective. So again, I'm just flagging that those are controversial terms, uh, but just a use in perspective. So really 
teaching people about the abstinence violation effect or the effort factor and how someone's not at square one and that you can still kind of turn it around. It's not that it's no big deal, but to really watch out for that hopelessness and effort factor. Other important coping skills, say refusal skills of what will happen if you do get an offer. Uh, what if you see your dealer? What are you going to do? And really practicing role playing it, role modeling it. So perhaps they're uh, the person who's making an offer and you role model the skill, then you get them to do it. Again, practice is so important with these because often in the office with you, it seems simple, it seems okay, but then outside in real life, it's that much harder. So really the role plays are so important in role modeling. Assertiveness can also be important. Uh, often interpersonal conflicts can be a major trigger for you. Being able to, to manage these more effectively and also challenging sometimes people's beliefs about assertiveness. So sometimes people think they are being assertive, but they're actually maybe being a bit more aggressive or they might be more passive aggressive. So examining that and how would you uh, manage these different interpersonal situations that might be triggering for someone. Organizational or problem solving difficulties. So something that's often helpful for folks is scheduling their day and using the agenda. If you think of people who are experiencing substance use difficulties, especially on the more severe end of the spectrum, think about how much time is spent getting money to use, using, recovering from use, hiding up the fact that you use, it's a lot of time. So when that is no longer part of their life, there can be a lot of unstructured time. There can be a lot of boredom, which often is a trigger for, for people to use. And they're also maybe not feeling fulfilled. What's giving them meaning? What they, do they want their life to be like? Scheduling, agenda, how to work towards goals can be really helpful. The other thing in terms of prospective memory deficits, we know is common um, sort of sequelae of substance use. Perspective memory is remembering to do something. Someone might be very motivated to attend their appointment or to do their out of session practice. Yet it's very difficult cognitively uh, to do that. They have difficulties remembering to do something. So using things like schedules and agendas, reminders on phones, that can be really helpful to address that. Another coping skill, remembering the negative consequences. So people might be familiar with this coping technique since it's in other uh, different protocols of playing the case through. So imagine for yourself, let's take a side step. Let's imagine again a situation that many people have had experience with of again, changing their diet. And perhaps again, we'll go with the junk food example. I'm trying to reduce um, my, my use of potato chips or I'm trying to eat less, right? Imagine uh, you've got a really bad craving. Uh, you really want those, that potato chip, or you really want that ice cream, or you really want that cake. If you've ever been in that situation and you really have a strong craving, what are the thoughts that are going through your head? Feel free, type them into your box right now. When you really want, say, chips or chocolate or cake, what are the thoughts that are running through your head? right in that moment, you really want it. It would be so good. I'm dying for it, I need it. I deserve it, yeah. It won't matter, it just won't hurt, it won't be that bad, it's gonna be so great. Absolutely. We're thinking about the positive consequences, right? We're thinking about the good things that will happen as a result. Uh, of this use as a result of the chip. We're thinking about the good things, right? Are we thinking about the negative consequences? What's going to happen next? If yes, those potato chips are going to be so good or that ice cream is going to taste so yummy. Are we thinking about what might happen next? Or, well, then I'm going to feel guilty or then I'm going to be frustrated because I'm not meeting my goals. I'm getting farther away from that. That's true for any behavior change, and it's also true for changing substances. We 
when you're having a craving, often people are really thinking about the positive consequences, the good things that they would get from using. And that makes complete sense. That's how all of our brains work. Playing the tape through and remembering the negative consequences is saying, okay, yeah, you would get high, or maybe you would have a break from your anxiety. Your anxiety would reduce. But what would happen next? Let's play that movie all the way to the end. And especially if you've done some functional analyses, there's some evidence there, right? You can build on that that you've done together. What would happen next? What would happen next? What would happen next? And that's really important because it's very individualized. It's their personal experience of remembering the consequences of my use. Is it going to actually be that great? And it helps keep someone oriented to what are their goals. Because again, very similar, the next coping skill is remembering some of the values or goals, right? Okay, if you want to use, that's fine. But first think, is this going to get me closer to my goal? Is it going to get me closer to my value, right? Or is it going to get me farther away? And so it's kind of just slowing that whole thought and behavior process down of just wait a second, let me think it through. Because often it happens on automatic and often it can be very quickly. So just let's slow it down. Think about your values and goals. Is this behavior, is this going to get me closer or is it going to get me farther away? Another aspect that's very helpful in terms of coping skills is increasing pleasure and meaningful activity, including those with social connection and belonging, because we really want to build up the alternative reinforcers in someone's life, right? Often, when by the time someone is seeing us, they have problems in relationships, they may have occupational difficulties, there's often psychiatric uh, difficulties as well. There's, there's a lot of challenges. And, Someone may not be having many rewarding or much meaning in their life, and everybody needs to have fun. Everybody needs to connect with people. Whether you're an introvert or extrovert, that might look very different, but everyone has those important needs, and we need to find other ways for those to get met. And so that's really important. Some other things to really be mindful of when you're doing coping skills training is adjusting for cognitive and learning abilities. So we know that acquired brain injuries and traumatic brain injuries are highly prevalent in people with substance use disorders. And also, they can be a, a factor in the other psychiatric uh, difficulties, say problems with attention and learning. If you're having a lot of, say, hallucinations, it's very hard to concentrate in session and learn the different things that you're trying to learn. So then repetition is going to be even more important and keeping just to a couple key, key messages. Rehearsal, so practicing in session, doing things as much in session as possible or between sessions are helpful. Sometimes it's going to have to be, say, an imaginal exposure, imaginal rehearsal. So you're not going to actually, say, go to that family family you with a client, but okay, let's imagine you're at the family barbecue, you enter and someone says, hey, Carl, have a beer. What are you going to be thinking and feeling in that moment? What are you going to do? What might get in the way? Let's really imagine it and trying to really bring up that situation with as much sort of color and as much in there to try and make it as real as possible in the artificial office environment in which we work. Sometimes you might be doing behavior experiments. So a behavior experiment is a way to really test out a belief and collect some data. So for someone, a common one might be is, well, I'll be the only person not drinking at a party. And that will be really embarrassing. And so we might design a behavior experiment of, you know, if you're at a party or if you're at a social event, will you really be the only person not drinking alcohol? And an experiment for that is sometimes looking at, you know, who is drinking alcohol and how do you know? Lots of people may have drinks in their hands, but you do know for sure that they're alcoholic specifically, right? And also, would it be perhaps sometimes as big of a deal to not be drinking alcohol at a social event as one anticipates? So sometimes there can be different behavior experiments to test out beliefs or collect data 
for testing beliefs that can be very helpful. As mentioned, repetition can be very important, uh, or even saying the same thing in slightly different ways can help comprehension. And reminders can be very helpful. So here's an example. It's modified from the Substance Use Brain Injury Workbook, which is freely available. I have the resource at the end of my slides. But you might also notice as I modified this reminder card actually based on Catherine Carroll's uh, protocol. So you'll see the recognize, avoid, and cope is on there, as well as a couple different coping techniques. And this coping card has what are the top reasons for a change, the emergency plan, and then different phone numbers that you can call. And so it's a reminder people don't have it in their wallet, often right next to their money, is sometimes helpful to just again slow down the process of having that urge to use, slow it down, have you tried these things first what you're going to do. Because again, in the office, it can seem like the best laid plan, but in reality, outside, it can be that much harder. So reminder cards can be very helpful for some people. I've had other clients where instead they have taped pictures to this card because that has helped them really remember their values or their goals or what's important to them. And so that they have to look at that picture of their family or sometimes it's pets before they go out and use that, that has been a really helpful, hey, wait a second, let's slow this down. So let's look at Carl. What, what did we do together? What did CBT treatment look like? Well, the key coping skills is we identify high risk situations. So for him, it was being alone. Anytime he used alcohol was high risk for him to use cocaine. And then also emotions, feeling guilty, ashamed, hopeless, or feeling out of control. Those are high risk situations for him. Key techniques that were very helpful were testing thoughts. So we tested things like, I'm just going to mess up anyway. Uh, it's hopeless. Or I need a break. And the thing that I need a break is that thought was true. Often Carl was feeling overwhelmed, anxious, and distressed. He did need a break. But it was more of a the silent part of that thought that we actually have to tease apart of, well, and cocaine is going to give me that break. That was the really important part of, hey, wait a second, does cocaine really give you a break? Let's play that tape forward. Let's look at the whole picture, right? Because often he'd feel even worse, even more overwhelmed, have even more problems as a result. And hey, can I get a break in other ways? That was really important. Another common uh, thought of people will judge me if they knew my history, and so that led into a lot of secret, secretness and um, looking at that and what's helpful, could we test that out even a little bit within, within safety, because we've got to be honest, stigma is real and it's very important, we don't want to minimize that, so that was, that's of course a careful balance and it's very individualized and very specific to a situation. For Carl, it was also really important to find other fun activities that gave him a sense of mastery and pleasure. And this was also important for that comorbid depression that he had as well. So for Carl, this is a really great example of why it's so important to be individualized. Because for him, him doing laundry, specifically ironing clothes and organizing things, that was really fun for him and really gave him a sense of mastery and pleasure. You can imagine if, say, you recommended this to another person, laundry, ironing clothing, that might not be all that fun or give a whole sense of mastery or pleasure to many different people. But for Carl, it did, right? And so it's, again, so important to be individualized. What works for him and doing some experimenting there. Some other activities was biking and then also referring to couples counseling. And we even had a meeting with the partner present of how to help Carl cope because often the partner was doing things that they felt were helpful, but were not received by Carl as particularly helpful. So how could their partner assist Carl in uh, his recovery and what might be some more helpful ways to act? And then we also reviewed successful coping in high risk situations. So we did functional analysis for times when things went really well, to really pinpoint what were all the different things uh, that Carl was doing, because Carl didn't always notice some really great coping that he was doing. We also tailored our sessions, so uh, we tapered them down. So we were going once a week, then we went to once every two to three weeks, 
and then it was once a month, so it was kind of a slow decrease. By the end of treatment, he hadn't used cocaine for seven months, despite having the number of high-risk situations, getting offers, seeing his former dealer. Carl also decided, at least for now, he was going to avoid alcohol use. He really saw it as, that is really related to my cocaine use. I, I really think it would just be best to avoid it completely. He was an ongoing couple therapy. He had actually been promoted in his job. He was functioning much better, and things were going really well in that area of his life. Resources. So this is just a taster of CBT for substance use. Unfortunately, it can't be uh, too comprehensive. But for a couple of resources that I really like, my favorite, I've read a lot of books about CBT for substance use and addiction treatment. My all-time favorite is this one by Mitchison. I think it is just so great. Uh, it really goes over some of the theory, but then practical. What do you do? What do you say? I just think it is so wonderful. So if there was one book you were going to get uh, for CBT for 70, I would recommend this one. I think it's really wonderful. I also recognize that many of you are in situations where there may not be a whole lot of funds. Uh, for, for learning different techniques, or are you not even sure, do I want to make an investment to get a book? There's a great free resource. It's Kathleen Carroll's CBT Manual. It is from 1998, right? So this is an old CBT manual, and yet the relevant factors in terms of uh, relevant intervention, of, in terms of a functional analysis, different coping skills, they're still in there. Those are still techniques you want to use, and I like this manual as it kind of gives that uh, brief overview and it's freely available. So that would be one that I uh, would recommend as well. So next I have references, but I'm thinking it would be best to perhaps open it to questions and what people would like to discuss. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. We have received quite a few um, questions. So the first one is, is CBT effective continually throughout recovery, um, and especially through multiple relapses? Oh, that's a good question. It kind of sounds like there's multiple questions there. So typically when CBT has been investigated and researched, it's a, a group of sessions, say 12 sessions of CBT. And what they have found is with CBT, um, usually it's sometimes say right at the end of treatment, it might be comparable to say medication. But we find is over time, folks, it kind of, it's like a potentiating treatment effect. Folks tend to do better. So it seems like in terms of, if you take a long view in terms of CBT, it's very effective. I'm not, and the second question is, is it um, effective ongoing through multiple relapses, I, CBT is it's typically a time-limited treatment, right? Um, so usually it would be evaluated within that timeline. That being said is if someone uses during CBT, you do a functional analysis to figure out, hey, why did that relapse happen? What can we do? What are we missing? So that, that's how CBT copes with that, and so that would absolutely be important and relevant and, and part of the treatment. And that is included within those studies where it's been found successful. And then I'm going to say something else, but I forget what the last part of that question was. Um, the last part was um, through, is it um, effective through multiple relapses? Yeah, so I guess Part of it is I don't know because typically the, the CBT studies have been somewhat structured in that sort of 12 to 16 sessions. Your question, I'm not sure if you mean if say someone, let's say they used um, cocaine, then they were doing really well with CBT, but then they used it again. You know, I'm not sure of any research where it's looking at people where this is say their third or fourth recovery attempt and it's their third or fourth dose of CBT, how does that play out? I'm not, I'm not sure anyone's actually investigated that. Typically, they just take folks that meet criteria for the substance use disorder and then investigate it. It's not looking at 
say, subsequent doses of CBT, is it effective, say, a second or third or fourth time around? I think that's a really good empirical question. My bias would be, I think it would be helpful, but I've got to be honest that I don't think the research is there. All right, thank you. Um, the next one is, where can the free CBT reference be found? Sure. So the free manual is uh, from Kathleen Carroll. That's that reference right there at the bottom of those slides. If you just search, say, CBT cocaine use, um, it should probably come up, and it's with NIDA. It typically comes up pretty quickly when you start doing a search uh, just for a CBT manual cocaine use. That one comes up. It's, uh, it's hard for you to type in and remember all that, that link on those slides. Thank you. Um, so the next one is uh, back to with the CBT in the session. So um, knowing CBT is time limited, how about using CBT with substance use and the client doesn't show much improvement? Could you keep adding sessions, especially if they're court ordered for a year um, and that's not longer than the typical 12 to 16 sessions? Would it be helpful to add more on? Yeah, I personally would because I would treat it like, say, someone has depression and they are not getting better. They're getting more depressed. That, to me, indicates they're worsening. They need more support, not less support. So I would be inclined if someone's conditioning, condition is worsening, much like, say, with depression, much like with anxiety, I would be adding more support. I would also, of course, be really looking at what, what else is going on. Is there other people we could involve with it? Like, are they seeing psychiatry? Are they getting medications for their substance use disorder? Because that is also a really important adjunct that I wouldn't want to be ignored either. So are there any gaps here and other evidence-based techniques that we should also be including as well? Okay, um, do you feel that CBT would be applicable to gambling and eating disorders as well? Oh, great question. Yes, uh, so there are some CBT gambling protocols out there. So yes, it has been evaluated. It has been found to be very effective. With CBT for eating disorders, same thing. So there are some really good protocols out there, really good manuals. Uh, in terms of eating disorders, that it's absolutely uh, relevant. And I'm guessing as you went through uh, this webinar, you probably saw some similarities. That functional analysis is very similar to say some eating records that they do in CBT for eating disorders. There's some real similarities there. So yes, absolutely it's relevant. Okay, um, in regards to the example with Carl, was he drug tested to demonstrate that he had no cocaine use for seven months? Yeah, yeah, actually there was, there was some testing, yes. Um, during, okay, where in the stages of change would CBT be most highly effective to implement? Great question. So I would say someone can't be pre-contemplated because someone's saying there's no problem and you're working with someone about substance use disorders, it's, it's not gonna work uh, out so well. Really, we know from research, we want motivational interviewing for that. In terms of research, uh, typically people they're somewhat motivated, they're ready to make changes, otherwise they wouldn't be in the study, right? My clinical experience has been, if someone is at least somewhat willing to um, maybe reduce their use, maybe they're not committed to full abstinence, or they're saying, hey, I've got negative consequences in my life, maybe I want to make a change, I'm not totally sure, doing some of that functional analysis can be really helpful. Hopefully, again, people got experience with motivational interviewing. You look at that functional analysis, 
those positive and negative consequences, doing that leads so nicely into switching into motivational interviewing mode, right? Because you're already talking about pros and cons of use of, hey, this is really important, and it comes with these downsides, and it comes with these costs. So I would say CBT does not necessarily have to be someone who's in the full taking action stage and commitment uh, stage. I think it's okay if someone's ambivalent. And we also know from research, people's stages of change change throughout treatment, and that's to be expected, right? It's not, hey, you're in the, the action commitment phase, and you stay there for forever. We need to anticipate that their motivation is going to waver throughout treatment. And I think CBT is absolutely flexible to accommodate that. Awesome. Um, can you speak about using and identifying replacement thoughts for unhelpful thinking? Sure. Is there a particular, <laughs> that I could talk about that a lot, I guess, I'll talk generally is typically what you want to do is identify what are the different thoughts that are happening in that situation because often people have many different thoughts. And so first you want to identify what's sort of the hottest thought, what's the one that comes with sort of the most emotion content, right? So it might be I need a break or it could be I'm a failure, this is hopeless anyway. You want to find out what is the hottest thought there. And then that's the thought we want to challenge. And then we want to look at what is the evidence for and the evidence against that thought. And is it 100% true 100% of the time? Do we need to collect evidence potentially? Um, or sometimes there are some situations where we can't collect evidence, right? So I give the example sometimes of imagine you're driving on the freeway and someone cuts you off, what's the first thought that comes to mind? Most people are usually like, that person's a total jerk, right? That person has driven off and is now down the freeway. Can you collect evidence of whether that person is truly a jerk or whether there's perhaps a different way to think about it, like they were in a rush or there was an emergency? We can't really collect evidence either way, and there may not be evidence to collect either way of which one's true. Are they a jerk or was it an emergency? So then sometimes it's thinking, well, what is the most helpful way to think about this situation, right? What is going to help me the most? And sometimes it's not thinking about what's the most accurate thought, but what's the most helpful thought. All right, perfect. Um, is CBT effective with the current state of the opioid ad addiction epidemic? Oh, great question. All right. Oh, it's controversial <laughs> and it's complicated. So people have looked at CBT for opioid use disorder. What we do know is medications like methadone and suboxone, they are so important for opioid use disorder. The challenge with CBT for opioid use disorder when they've done the review is often there's not many studies looking at CBT specifically. CBT get lump, gets lumped in with a lot of different interventions that are very different from CBT. So uh, it'll be lumped in with 12-step, it'll be lumped in with psychodynamic, it'll be lumped in with supportive counseling. And again, it's not that those are bad interventions or not helpful, but when the reviews are looking at, hey, is, is psychotherapy effective, they have a whole bunch of different interventions that are being lumped in together. And so if you go onto, say, the Cochrane database of, hey, is psychosocial treatment effective for opioid use, opioid use disorder, it's kind of, eh, not really, but they have so many different interventions that are lumped in there that I'm, I personally am not convinced that it's a very meaningful um, conclusion that's being drawn because so many different interventions are included there. What we do know is that CBT is effective for other substance use disorders. Uh, opioid use hasn't been evaluated very well for uh, CBT. And we also know CBT is very effective for often many of the comorbid disorders that people are having. 
like chronic pain, like depression, like uh, social anxiety or generalized anxiety, those are often comorbid with a substance use disorder. The substance use disorder is not the only thing that's going on for a person. And then CBT is very effective for those different disorders. So I'd say CBT absolutely is very relevant for the opioid use epidemic because the people who are using opioids are experiencing many problems in their complex and CBT is very effective for many of the problems that people are facing. All right, and the last one that we have is, is there a highly recommended CBT resource focused towards adolescent clients? Yes, absolutely. So it's been found to be very effective for children and adolescents. I don't have one specifically to point you to because it depends on what, what are the presenting problems, right? So CBT for children with anxiety looks very different to, say, CBT for, say, needle phobia in children, because that's a common thing, a fear of needles, uh, to then looking at, say, CBT for anxiety or depression. So what protocols or books I'd recommend really depends on what are the presenting issues um, for those adolescents. Okay, perfect. Um, those are all of the questions that we have received. Um, so we'll close the questions period at this time. If anyone has additional questions, feel free to email them to us at info at irata.org, and we can send them over to Heather, and I'm sure she'll be happy to answer them for everyone. Um, so thank you all again for your great questions, and thanks to Dr. Fulton for such a great webinar. Um, at this time, I would like to go over our evaluation and CEU instructions. You will receive a few emails from us following this webinar. The first email will include a link to our evaluation. Our evaluators are pleased to collect feedback from all event participants. Completion of the evaluation is critical to continue to provide quality education and materials. Your participation is appreciated and the evaluation should take no more than two minutes of your time. The second email will be sent around to all registrants early next week and will include a link to the recording as well as a PDF version of Dr. Fulton's slides. To request the Certificate of Attendance and or NADAC and PCB CEUs, you will need to log into your My IRETA profile. Once you are logged in, you'll go to today's webinar and then select the type of certificate you would like to download. Please note that certificates may take up to 48 hours to appear in your profile, so again, we ask for your patience. Again, we want to thank everyone for your participation today, and if you have any questions, please email us at info at Thank you so much, everyone.